Hello, and thanks for tuning in. In this video, we are highlighting the life of James Hunter Young, a prominent black politician and activist in North Carolina, and the first African American to receive the rank of Colonel and command a full-size regiment in the United States military. He was a contemporary of Charles B. Acock. Now, as a quick aside, James Young from North Carolina should not be confused with Colonel Charles Young, who was born in Kentucky and lived most of his life in Ohio, who was the third ever African-American graduate of the United States Military Academy at West Point, where he graduated in 1889, and the first African-American career army officer to attain the rank of colonel in the U.S. regular army in 1917, after having risen through the ranks. Our video is not about Colonel Charles Young. Our video is about James Hunter Young. If you want to know more about Charles, be sure to check out the Charles Young Buffalo Soldiers National Monument website or Facebook page. So, James Hunter Young was born on October 26, 1858, near Henderson, North Carolina, to an enslaved mother and a white father. He attended school in Henderson after emancipation and was accepted into Shaw University in Raleigh, which he attended from 1874 to 1878. So his natural talents land him a job when he graduates with the IRS as an internal revenue collector in North Carolina's 4th District. He's pretty good at it and is quickly promoted to chief clerk and cashier. About the same time, he starts getting involved in the socially progressive politics of the Republican Party. Young's charismatic personality catches the attention of many politicians, and he becomes a rising star within the Republican Party in North Carolina. Over the course of the next 10 years, there's a whirlwind of power struggles between Democrats and Republicans, both in North Carolina and just in the United States in general, and James Young's life is caught up in the fight every time. Each step he tries to take uh, to, to get higher, conservative Democrats push him back down. But in 1883, he's elected to the Raleigh Board of Aldermen, although he's promptly removed by the Democrat-controlled board. In 1884, Young becomes a delegate for the Republican National Convention. And in 1885, when Democrat Grover Cleveland is elected president, Young is removed from his position with the IRS. In 1886, white Republican colleagues in North Carolina find him a desirable appointment in Wake County, and then he rises even further in 1889 under a new Republican president, Benjamin Harrison, uh, when he becomes the Special Inspector of Customs, which is a position that Henry Cheatham, a black congressman from North Carolina, assists in getting him. In 1890, President Harrison selected Young for a prestigious and lucrative position as a customs agent, but it was blocked in Washington, D.C. by Senate Democrats. In 1892, Young once again serves as a delegate in the RNC. Finally, in 1893, Democrat Grover Cleveland, who is now re-elected president, relieves Young of his federal post. This doesn't set back James Hunter Young, though. In June of 1893, Young starts publishing The Gazette, a weekly newspaper in Raleigh. Under Young's ownership from 1893 to 1898, it becomes one of the most prominent black newspapers in North Carolina. The Gazette was socially progressive. It dealt with racial uplift, education, self-improvement, and gave advice on improving the economic situation of African Americans. During the complicated political upheavals in the 1890s, James Young used his newspaper to promote an unlikely alliance under what became known as the Fusion Party, publishing frequent articles connecting the interests of black North Carolinians, poor white populists, and Republicans. He convinced radical black Republicans to trust and accept the white populists as valuable and advantageous allies. Within a year, Young was elected in 1894 to the state legislature as a Fusion representative for Wake County, and was re-elected in 1896. Despite constant criticism from Democrats, most notably from Josephus Daniels, who was a good friend of Charles B. Acock, and the editor of the rival newspaper, The Raleigh News and Observer, Young continued to prove himself an energetic and charismatic personality and was placed on many state committees. 
He was engaged with black education, prison reform, charities, and other social programs, and proudly served as a board member for a school for deaf and blind children in Raleigh. He was also instrumental in rallying voters for Republican Daniel Lindsay Russell, who was elected governor in 1896, and who then rewarded Young with more prestigious appointments. But in 1898, war broke out between Spain and the United States over a crisis in Spanish-owned Cuba. North Carolina started raising troops to fight in the Spanish-American War, but struggled to raise enough white troops to meet the federal quota called for by President William McKinley. Governor Russell obtained special permission to enlist a black infantry regiment instead of a battery of artillery. Governor Russell and recognized the black community that supported him and helped him get in power through the fusion political movement, then authorized James Young to command this black regiment. So Young recruits 43 officers and 978 men from all over the state to form the 3rd North Carolina USV, or United States Volunteers. Governor Russell signs the commission, and James Young becomes Colonel Young, the first African-American colonel to ever serve in the U.S. military in the first full-sized, entirely black regiment with black officers in U.S. history. So there are several other black listed at this time, and there are Buffalo soldiers who served out West over the previous decades, but they had almost exclusively white officers in those regiments. Illinois and Kansas also after the, the raising of the 3rd North Carolina, they also raised regiments with entirely African-American soldiers and officers, but the 3rd North Carolina was the first and only of its kind raised in the American South during the war. The 3rd North Carolina arrived at Fort Macon, stationed among white troops who were angry about serving alongside black soldiers. The war overlapped with a violent election season in 1898. Charles B. Aycock, had traveled hundreds of miles around the state campaigning for various Democrats, warning crowds of the horrors of black domination and rule that would come if they allowed Republicans to be elected. Aycock and the conservative press painted James Hunter Young's 3rd North Carolina as Governor Russell's private army and labeled them a political stunt, an experiment that was doomed to fail. Colonel Young knew that his regiment needed to be perfect to gain respect, or at least to avoid scandals and the media's gotcha tactics, and trained his men strictly. They petitioned to go overseas and see combat, but were ignored by the War Department, despite the fact that they had gained quite a reputation for proficiency in drill and discipline. By August 1898, though, the Spanish-American War was over. And meanwhile, the political situation in North Carolina was rapidly deteriorating. Racial tensions were escalating, segregation laws were being passed, and while white troops were being mustered out and sent home, the 3rd North Carolina remained active and was getting ready to be posted elsewhere. So its first, first posting outside of North Carolina was at Knoxville, Tennessee, at a place called Camp Poland, and they later went to Camp Haskell in Macon, Georgia. Both of these places, they were very unpopular with the locals and were discriminated against, uh, which had quite an impact on their morale. But Colonel Young maintained his composure and protested against their poor treatment. Colonel Young and his troops were regularly vilified. Uh, local newspapers threw false accusations of poor and dangerous conduct pretty regularly. Uh, and while in Knoxville, the War Department responded to the 3rd North Carolina's treatment by temporarily promoting Colonel Young to acting brigade commander. So, strictly speaking, an acting brigade commander is performing the role of a commander of several regiments. And normally, this rank would make you a brevet brigadier general in charge of a brigade. So, this would put James Hunter Young in the highest amount of military authority ever granted to an African American in the U.S. military up to that point. Prominent visitors to their camp helped to dispel some of these false rumors that are being spread in the newspapers. The president of Shaw University, Charles Meserve, uh, came to visit uh, while they were stationed in Georgia and noted, the spirit and discipline of the officers and men was admirable and reflected great credit upon the old North state. The secret of it was 
confidence in their leader. They believe in their colonel, and the colonel in turn believes in his men. Colonel James Young possesses, in a marked degree, a quality of leadership as important as it is rare. He probably knows by name at least three-quarters of his regiment, and is on pleasant terms with his staff and the men in his ranks, and yet maintains a proper dignity, such as befits his official rank. Um, a West Point graduate, Captain J.C. Gresham of the 7th U.S. Cavalry, noted that he had never met a more capable man than Colonel Young. Most surprisingly, the 3rd North Carolina even won over some of the newspapers in Knoxville. Uh, one of them admitted, the men realize that their actions are being watched closely, and it is their desire to so conduct themselves as to gain the confidence and respect of everyone with whom they came in contact as true soldiers. But in January 1899, the 3rd North Carolina finally received word they would be sent home. Conservative Democrats had meanwhile taken over uh, North Carolina and stripped away most of the progress, if not all of the progress, that had been made by the fusionists. They passed literacy laws, expand segregation, and disenfranchised large swaths of the African-American population within a year of the third North Carolina returning to their home state. James H. Young returns to private life and devotes himself to the community that had supported him for so many years. Uh, he is involved with all of the same organizations that he had been involved with before the war, uh, but he now doubles a lot of his efforts. His Republican allies in Washington, D.C. had also not forgotten him. President McKinley appointed him Deputy Revenue Collector in Raleigh. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt and William Taft reappointed him uh, during their terms as well. Though still a target, Democrats removed his name from the cornerstone of the Raleigh School for Deaf and Blind Children, which was particularly painful to him as serving on the school's board was one of his proudest achievements. Finally, when Woodrow Wilson became president, Young lost his appointment and was replaced by a conservative white Democrat, which was noted at the time to be particularly significant because by 1913, James H. Young was the sole African-American man occupying a federal position of any consequence in North Carolina. By World War I, he became a highly demanded speaker at patriotic rallies and advised selective service officials regularly in drafting black soldiers. Upon his death in the spring of 1921, his former newspaper rival from the Raleigh News and Observer, Josephus Daniels, who at this point was Woodrow Wilson's Secretary of the Navy, attended his funeral. The Raleigh News and Observer noted that throughout his life, progressive black Republicans never questioned his leadership or the wisdom of his advice. Despite white supremacists inflicting constant setbacks on him his entire life, despite newspapers constantly vilifying his every move, James Hunter Young was undeterred and embodied the hopes and aspirations of the North Carolina black community to assert their equal rights owed to them as citizens.